Greetings and welcome to this week's episode of Bronx Bombers. My name is Joe Rubenstein and it is Wednesday, May 23rd, and the Yankees this year, for the most part, have overcome more than a few mediocre pitching performances um, and won ball games they had no business winning by coming back from behind with a ferocious offensive attack, but not last night. Domingo Herman, who was just beyond awful, four hits, three walks, six runs, two home runs, and what seemed like a hundred wild pitches, but I think was actually five. The hole he put us in right out of the gate was just too deep. And unfortunately, we were facing a really good pitcher for a change in Cole Hamels. And really, it was a game that I found disturbing, and it sort of encapsulated why the Yankees should not be mesmerized by their one-loss record and definitely need to attack head-on the problem of improving this pitching staff because in the playoffs when you're facing guys like Hamels or better every night five six run comebacks that's going to be a bridge too far you can follow us on twitter at bombers podcast is the handle you can also send us questions we'll try to answer each and every week in our mailbag segment here on the podcast you can like us on facebook subscribe to our show on itunes or stitcher you can also drop us a line if you like 646-854-4959 and as always you can send your comments and questions to joe at bronxbomberspodcast.com really however you'd like to engage with us we love engaging with you coming up a little bit later on in our twitter poll this week some interesting results when we asked who should lose a roster spot when greg Burke comes back. And I'll answer a fascinating question from one of our followers about who might be the greatest catcher in franchise history. Also, he's the host of the excellent Bronx Beat podcast. EJ Fagan rejoins the show for part two of our conversation, and we'll go through the good, the bad, and the ugly from this last week of action. All that and more coming up on today's Bronx Bombers. Back in a moment. Bronx Bombers Trivia. Which of these four major league teams did Billy Martin never manage? Is it A, the Texas Rangers, B, the Cleveland Indians, C, the Detroit Tigers, or D, the Minnesota Twins? The answer coming up a little bit later in the podcast. And now here's Joe with this week's Main Thing. Well, here's the thing. Our three wins this past week, two in Kansas City and one in Texas, uh, were so dominating, so overwhelming, scoring eight in the first and ten in the other two, that it's tempting to forget about the two losses, which were both pretty ugly. And the fact is that unlike the last two weeks, we do not, my friends, have the best record in baseball Boston does. Now, they've also played three more games than we have, and as we discussed last week, have had a much easier schedule. I mean, but one of these two teams is going to have a bitter pill to swallow in October because it's entirely possible, it's actually probable, that a team with well over 100 wins is going to be forced to play a wild card game. And we all know those games are a roll of the dice. So the division, winning the division, it's absolutely paramount. And on that portentous note, we get into... The good, the bad, and the ugly, as we take a hard look at some of the individual performances from this last week of action, which, because of the two rainouts in Washington, only amounted to five games, three in Kansas City and now two in Texas. So the good section, incredibly, miraculously, is headlined by none other than Sonny Gray. And it gives me great pleasure, honestly, after weeks of raking him over the coals, uh, that at least for one start on Sunday in Kansas City, against an admittedly weak offense, working quickly and efficiently with Austin Romine, and managing to complete eight strong innings and only 92 pitches. He was dominant, not allowing a hit until Hunter Dozier singled with two outs in the fifth, allowing just four hits and one run over those eight innings. And you could see it right away. I tweeted after the second inning that this is the most you know, dominant Sonny Gray we've seen in a Yankee uniform. And I hesitated to send that tweet because of how many times we've been burned by two great innings followed by three innings of Drek. But his greatness maintained throughout. He walked around the mound like he owned it. He had his great slider working. And again, his best performance by far in a Yankee uniform. And did he get great run support? Of course. That was the first of two consecutive games in which the Yankees scored 10 runs, and uh, Sunday Gray's battery mate, Austin Romine, also had a hell of a game and makes the good section as well. Romine, who's now hitting 326 on the year with an on base of 400, went 3 for 5 on Sunday with a homer, a double, and two RBIs, another big home run last night, and there's really no reason for Boone to hesitate using Romine.
aroma in his gray's personal catcher if he's putting up these kinds of numbers. And I've been skeptical of the personal catcher thing. I mean, Roman caught gray in Boston. He was terrible. And it happened again against Oakland. But overall, I guess the numbers show that gray works better with Roman. So I'm all for it if these are the results. And, you know, what a weapon it would be. What a boost to this Yankee club if Sonny Gray could go out and give that kind of performance even two out of three appearances. Another Yankee who's had a monster week after an inconsistent start to the season, exacerbated by an injury, was Aaron Hicks, who's been an absolute beast from both sides of the plate. Hicks in the last week hitting 421 with a triple and two home runs, including an inside the Parker in Kansas City, a second of the year, uh, three walks and four RBIs. Also good has been Giancarlo Stanton hitting 350 this week with a double, a homer, two RBIs and four runs scored and Tyler Austin who we'll discuss later in our Twitter poll Austin hitting 375 this week with three home runs and seven RBIs and putting up those numbers while not playing every day is nothing to sneeze at and last but not least is my man Glaber Torres who I know I'm biased but he's he, to me he's the clear front runner for the AL rookie of the year I mean which would mean the Yankees would have two in a row uh, but Glaber hit 333 this week with four home runs and those weren't cheap These were bombs. Three walks this week and six RBIs. And Glaber made a number of sparkling plays at second base. Too many to count, really. He's been, you know, I won't say he's been a revelation because he was a highly touted prospect. And I talked him up big time on this podcast before the season. But he's been the most productive rookie this season in the majors and almost certainly the best nine hitter in baseball. Now, whether Boone moves him up or not, you know, if DD continues to struggle, that's an open question. But for now, it's working. So all those players really, really good this week. Bad for the second straight start was CC Sabathia, the loser on Friday night in Kansas City. That was a night where nobody played well. And, you know, two defensive flubs by Glaber, totally out of character, didn't help. But CC, only five innings pitched, four hits, four walks, a home run, and four runs. It's the walks that killed him. One of those walks uh, to Hunter Dozier coming with the bases loaded, and another time CC walked the Royals' number nine hitter, Abraham Almonte, who's hitting 205. Pretty unforgivable. So awful job by a CC for the second start in a row. CC took the loss, and you know he's our starter tonight. So let's hope he does what he did last year so often, which is you know give us a win after a very tough loss. That would be ten straight series victories in a row. No small accomplishment. Also bad has been Aaron Judge, who had a number of Uh, just really awful at bats in both Kansas City and Texas. Half-hearted swings at pitches way out of the zone. You know, sometimes Judge looks super focused, and sometimes he looks like he's practicing his golf swing. I mean, just guessing and guessing badly. And Judge has never graced this section before, so I don't want to spend a whole lot of time killing him. And, you know, let's hope this is the last time this season. It wouldn't surprise me, actually. I think, you know, I have a lot of faith in Aaron Judge. Our ugly section certainly needs to include Domingo Herman, whose abysmal performance last night we already discussed up top but let's not leave out Masahiro Tanaka who for the third straight start on Monday gave us a non-quality start and who continues to give up home runs like they're going out of style since the start of last season the home run to Odor on Monday was his 46th given up that's the most in the majors he's exhibiting very little control over his split finger fastball and it's getting mauled and even worse he's walking guys and forcing this Yankees offense to play from behind every single single time he pitches. And, you know, even though we won that game, as I said, the pitching continues to be a concern for me. And it's not just our starters. Um, Chad Green seems very hittable this year. He's not mixing his pitches. He almost gave up like four home runs the other night. I mean, like seriously, three at the warning track, one like an inch just off the foul pole. And his fastball is getting hammered. And David Robertson has looked very mortal as well. Now, that's somewhat been bolstered by Holder, Batances, and Chapman who've pitched well. But, you know, tonight, Tanaka needs to be better, a lot better, frankly. And he's getting, he's starting to fit into that niche of Yankee pitchers who over the past few years just, you know, look brilliant in one start and then just terrible the next two. I'm thinking of, you know, Ivan Nova. I'm thinking of Michael Pineda, just, you know, gray to an extent. So, you know, Tanaka needs to figure this out. And it's just, he's been just too damn inconsistent. Also ugly have been Didi Gregorius's numbers. He had an RBI double on Monday, but, you know, yeah, this week, no better than last week, really, hitting 125 with just one RBI, zero walks. Again, often swinging at total garbage. Now, he, he's making better contact, so I assume this slump is nearing its termination, and that really can't come soon enough because 
Frankly, it's getting really depressing. And runners up to my good section this week are Neil Walker, who hit his first home run as a Yankee on Monday in Texas and hit 333 this week with three RBIs. Ronald Torres, who filled in admirably for Didi when Boone gave Didi those two days off in Kansas City. Torres going three for nine with a double and two runs scored. And Miguel Andujar is keeping Brandon Drury in AAA by continuing to contribute with the bat and by not being a liability defensively. Andujar hitting 333 this week with a double, a triple, and two home runs. And this Yankee team is just so incredibly deep. As I'm sure you've noticed, it's different guys every week making this list. And, you know, we're doing this without Greg Bird, you know, with one of our best relievers, Tommy Canely, on the DL and through a host of injuries and various slumps. So at least at this point in the season, you know, pitching, as I said, is a problem. But, you know, it's fair to say offensively, this is the most dynamic, versatile, and powerful Yankee team I've seen since 1998. Back in a moment. Back here on Bronx Bombers, and our featured guest once again is E.J. Fagan, host of the Bronx Beat podcast. You're going to hear part two of our conversation, which we begin with a question about some Yankees who may be struggling. Now, back on April 11th on your podcast, you did a segment on whether or not Yankee fans should be concerned about some players who were struggling at that time, specifically Sanchez, Stanton, and Andujar. Are there any guys on the current roster on either side of the ball that you're worried about? And on the flip side, we've had some Yankees perform better than expected. Jonathan Holder, uh, Batances lately. So two questions. Who are you concerned about, if anyone, and who's been the most pleasant surprise? I'm definitely worried about Sonny Gray, and we've already talked about that. And I think that is it is the Yankees become dangerously thin if Sonny Gray is not at least a, an above average starting pitcher, um, because then you have to start worrying about what happens if the Yankees lose CC Sabathia for a month with like a hamstring strain. You have to start worrying about who's going to pitch Game Four in the playoffs, those kinds of things. Um, but for the most part, I, I think that he'll he'll um, I think he'll recover a little bit, and that um, uh, if not, the Yankees can can find a replacement. I'm worried about the bullpen. I'm really worried about the bullpen. I think Raldis Chapman will be fine, and I think Chad Green looks fine. But everybody else in that bullpen, they're starting to look a little old, right? I mean, Tommy Conley hopefully returns from the shoulder injury, thrown as hard as he did, did before, but he did not look good uh, before he went to the disabled list. David Robertson has been been fish uh, been been giving up some real hard hit balls. He's still getting the strikeouts. He's still getting the walks. But when people hit David Robertson, unlike at pretty much any point in his career, the ball goes a long way, and that scares me a little bit. And I know Batances is pitching better, but I don't trust Alan Batances at this point. I mean, the guy breaks down as soon as he, he a runner gets on base, and I don't know I don't know if you can trust him to get the seventh inning. You know, the the, the to get the seventh inning against the Red Sox in the playoffs. That that scares me a bit. Now, as far as the outfield, I did a piece on this podcast back in March predicting that Aaron Judge would not fall prey to a sophomore slump. And I was happily correct. Beyond my wildest dreams, in fact, I think he's become a better hitter, a more judicious hitter, strikes out less, taking more walks, hits for power and average. So two-part question on the outfield. What's the ceiling for Judge, in your opinion? I mean, are we looking at a potential Hall of Famer? And second part, given the crowded outfield with Stanton, Judge, Hicks, Gardner. Is there a place for Clint Frazier on this team this season, or is it going to be a matter of waiting out Gardner's contract before Frazier gets his shot, um, assuming he's not traded? So let's talk about Aaron Judge first. Aaron Judge, here's my take on Aaron Judge. You're right that he's been much more judicious this season. He's taking more walks and he's striking out a little bit less, and that's great. He's also hitting the ball a lot less hard, like a lot less hard. Uh, so, so StatCast uh, keeps track of a statistic called barrels per plate appearance. And what a barrel is, it's just the, the, the perfect combination of exit velocity and launch angle. So you're hitting a line drive hard enough. Um, and, and those balls statistically are just very, very valuable. And Aaron Judge is nowhere near the top of the barrels leaderboard this year. Last year, he was second in the league in barrels to like Randall Grichuk or something like that. Um, Aaron Judge has, is 42nd in the league this year. He's, he's hitting about half as many barrels as he did in previous years. Now, he's striking out less and he's walking more, so that offsets some of that production. But the overall result is that his ex-WOBA, the statistic that StatCast puts out to estimate the, the um, production uh, based on batted ball quality, is quite a bit lower than it was last year. I think it's about 50 points lower. 
than it was last year. Still good. Like, still, you know, one of the best players in baseball. So, that, you know, that that's not to say anything. But, like, the otherworldly, like, Mike Trout-level Tratt heights that he at times showed last year, so far he hasn't showed. Maybe that's because he's being more being more judicious. He's, you know, maybe swinging not as hard all the time or, or whatever. Um, maybe that's because pitchers are adjusting to him and he's forced to essentially go with a normal human level of, of MVP-level offensive production, but not not go, go as far as, as he did kind of at times last year. I think Clint Frazier is really good. Clint Frazier, since he, you know, he had the concussion that he, he had to deal with coming out of spring training, um, and the Yankees sent him down to the minor leagues, first as, as a rehab assignment, and then once he was healthy, they just optioned him down. And he has he has been basically everything that they could have asked for. He's hitting 323, 408, 645 slugging at AAA. That's four home runs, two triples. His strikeout rate is manageable. He's taking walks. He looks like a star. And I think that I think he's going to force his way into this major league roster if he keeps doing this for even a couple more weeks. And I think Brett Gardner should be looking at his starting job right now. So you're saying maybe Brett Gardner's job as a starter could be in danger? I think that Brett Gardner is showing his age at the moment. And although he's come through for the Yankees in some big moments, and he's hit a little bit better as of late, he's still one of the worst hitters on this roster at the moment. And he's a good enough defensive player to still be valuable given how well he's hitting. But I think there's a very strong probability that Clint Frazier is just better at everything right now than Brett Gardner. And if Clint Frazier does this for two weeks, you know, keeps up a thousand OPS or triple A, you can't hold him back. Yeah, but it seems to me that Cashman kind of plays favorites and, you know, Bird is one of them, Gardner another. And I'm kind of wondering if he'll lean towards going with the veteran rather than giving the young upstart a shot. Well, you know, this is the team that not that recently retired Alex Rodriguez and basically bumped off uh, Mark Teixeira to get Aaron Judge, Gary Sanchez, and Tyler Austin in the lineup. So, I, I think the Yankees are, are are willing to make that tough choice. I don't think they should cut Brett Gardner. I think they should demote him to kind of fourth outfielder, plays only against righties, that kind of thing. And uh, Clint Frazier plays much more often. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, now, you and I talked about the Aaron Boone hire back in January. I was okay with it. You were kind of lukewarm. You know, it's tough to assess a manager's performance. You can look at one loss, you know, and, and by that standard, Boone's been a knockout. But then the question arises, you know, how much of those wins can you attribute to the manager? Probably not much. But what have you seen from Boone the first quarter of the season, positive and negative? And just generally speaking, how do we assess a manager? I mean, is it simply one loss? record or you know are there other ways as well yeah I don't think it's one loss right I, I don't think you give a manager credit for having Aaron Judge on his team right because Aaron Judge is going to win a lot of games on his own I think the the Yankees let's evaluate Aaron Boone three ways so first is he you know is he doing any of the really dumb manager stuff that I was a little bit afraid he would do because he's a bit of an old school guy and so far none of that right they're not bunting with nobody out in the second inning in fact they they might not even be bunting enough you know I, they they've had some situations where in the 8th and ninth inning with you know with a you know when they where they only needed one run that they didn't bunt and I was, I was a little bit unhappy there um you know he's not bringing in relief pitching in in, in dumb ways he's for the most part managing by the book He's even been willing to entertain the idea of some kind of weird lineups. I would love to see, for example, a lineup with Aaron Judge batting first. The Nationals tried that with Bryce, uh, with Bryce Harper, and it worked out great. And Aaron Judge is basically Bryce Harper, and I, I think that's something that they should consider consider thinking about. Um, but for the most part, you know, he's he's been a pretty progressive manager, and I, and I like that. The players seem happy. The players seem to like Aaron Aaron Boone. They seem to be relaxed. All the kind of player management stuff feels, feels fine. You got a lot of players slumping and kind of underperforming, uh, but I don't I don't think you can blame Aaron, Aaron Boone for that at all. And you know the you know he's he's doing all the PR stuff that works and, and is a good you know, ambassador for the team. So so far so good. But I, I, I reserve the right to reassess after the season. Yeah, I mean, we're only a quarter of the way home. All right, final question, EJ. I know you follow baseball beyond just the Yankees, as I do. So looking around the majors, I mean, the biggest two shockers to me, negative and positive, are first of all, how bad the Dodgers have looked. I mean, just getting swept at home in a four-game set by the Reds, who've been dreadful, you know, that, that shocked me. But on the positive side, I mean, I knew the Braves would be improved with a healthy Freddie Freeman and a huge collection of incredible young talent. But looking around the majors, uh, what's the biggest surprise to you a quarter of the way now into the season? Yeah, I mean, the Dodgers have to be that negative surprise. Um, and, and along with the Dodgers, I'm going to go with the Indians. 
those are two teams that I thought were pretty like unbeatable, or not unbeatable, or uh, were pretty bulletproof um, going into last season. They were deep teams. They had teams. They, they were teams, um, you know, with a lot of guys who were in their prime. You know, guys like Corey Seager and Francisco Lindor are cornerstones of teams that that, that make that that can you know bring a lot of success just kind of on their own. You know, the Dodgers are. You can blame it on injuries, right? I mean, Corey, what are you going to do about the Corey Seager injury? What are you going to do about the, the Clayton Kershaw injury? I think they have about seven other injured players who I haven't mentioned. So Justin Turner. Yeah. Jo- oh God, yeah. Justin Turner hasn't, hasn't had a plate appearance this season. I mean, th- this is a team and and that should have like more more of their their guys in the field than they ha- than they have. And so that that that's an age old story in baseball. And I'm confident that once this team is healthy, that they'll be pretty good. Now, maybe they don't get healthy in time for to make the playoffs. That's an interesting question. Um, but I'm a little more amazed by the Indians. I mean, the Cleveland Indians, they, their players are on the field. All of them. Everybody's playing. In fact, some of them are playing well. Francisco Lindor and Jose Ramirez are both slugging 600. And in the worst division in baseball, the Cleveland Indians can't crack 500. That's crazy. I mean, Michael Brantley is back on the field for the first time in years and batting 340. And the Indians can't crack 500. And it's because that pitching staff has been just terrible. We, we saw we saw you know Clevenger and Bauer look pretty good, but um, while I'm actually looking at the pitching staff and it hasn't been terrible, now I don't know why. I was just assuming. Yeah, Andrew Miller was hurt for a while too. That was part of it. Andrew Miller was hurt. Um, you know, Josh Tomlin's been getting starts, so that's not great. But you know, this is a team that should not be underperforming the way that it is. Again, players are mostly on the field, and they're still bad. And I don't know. I don't know how to explain that. I mean, the, the the it looks to me like the Indians have only really had one player really disappoint. That's been Edwin Encarnacion, and he's old. Maybe this is just the end of his career. I don't know what. If I'm the Indians, I don't know what's what 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 I do to fix what's going on right now. I guess they're probably saved by the fact that they just have no competition in that division. Yeah. In the National League, I mean, the NL East to me is fascinating. I mean, the Nationals started slow. The Mets started hot. Then they fell. Uh, The Braves and Phillies are surprisingly good. Um, Braves currently in first place. But do you think that's kind of an early season mirage and the Nationals end up on top? I mean, if the Nationals can get healthy, I think that they'd be great. But, I mean, they've they've also just been just hammered by injuries this season. Um, I mean, I feel bad for Adam Eaton, who for the second consecutive year might lose essentially the entire year to a different injury. That, that's tough to watch, and they've had trouble, I think, keeping Trey Turner on the field and all of that. I, I think that that team's pitching staff is tough to beat. I mean, that, that pitching staff, you know, Scherzer, Scherzer, Strasburg, I like Tanner Roark personally, Gio Gonzalez, you know, Jeremy Hellickson somehow is good. I think, I think that that starting staff is pretty good, and really what they need is a bullpen. And they need to go out and get, you know, the best reliever available at the deadline and they'll be fine. I'm not convinced that there's really any other competition in that division. So I guess no rush. Uh, But once that team gets healthy, I think it's kind of on the, the Houston level. Personally. That's EJ Fagan, host of the Bronx Beat Podcast, which all you guys should go check out and subscribe to. It's a really it's a podcast that really cuts through the fog and the hype and zeroes in on substance with a firm basis in numbers. But uh, EJ, thanks so much for being with us again here on Bronx Bombers. We'll do it again soon, okay? All right, Joe, thanks for having me. All right, we'll come back. More Bronx Bombers in just a moment. And now the answer to today's Bronx Bombers trivia question. Which of these four teams, the Texas Rangers, the Cleveland Indians, the Detroit Tigers, or the Minnesota Twins, did Billy Martin not manage? The answer, B, the Cleveland Indians. And now here's Joe with this week's Twitter poll. Yes, this week's Twitter poll results are in. We asked you this. When Greg Bird returns from his injury, who should lose their roster spot? And by the way, that return will likely be sometime this week, maybe Friday. Uh, Bird is now playing for AAA Scranton and appears to have recovered nicely from that surgery. And is just trying to get back in the rhythm of playing, you know, regular nine inning baseball. But 62% of our followers on Twitter at Bombers Podcast said Neil Walker should lose his roster spot. And 38% said it should be Tyler Austin. And those were the only two really viable backup first base options. Um, you know, yes, Romine has played about 20 major league games at first, 
Um, but he's our backup catcher, and he's playing really well. And you don't want to have him doing uh, double duty. It makes no sense. So look, I've been praising Neil Walker to the skies on this podcast recently, but my answer is that he should be the one to lose his roster spot. And before I give my reasoning, let me tell you what that would mean. They can't send Neil Walker to the minors unless you know he's injured and it's a rehab assignment. Um, so if Walker's the one who loses his spot, he'd probably be designated for assignment and then traded. Um, this way, the Yankees get that $4 million they owe him off the books, freeing up more room for moves before the trading deadline, most likely for starting pitching, which we need. Now, Tyler Austin is still a rookie, so he has minor league options. I mean, the Yankees could send him down and keep both players, which wouldn't be the dumbest move in the world either, because Bird, you know, Bird hasn't played a full season like ever. I mean, last year he played 48 games. That's the most games he's played in any given season. He's been incredibly injury prone for three years running. So why then would I lose Walker and not Austin? Well, the short answer is I think he's a better offensive player. I think he's got more upside. I think he's particularly good against left-handed pitching, which Bird is not, uh, nor is Walker. So it's a better platoon with Bird. I mean, Tyler Austin is hitting 324 against left-handers with four home runs. I'm not knocking Walker. He's he's a smart player. He's a good guy. He's been more effective recently. But let's compare the numbers. And they've had close to the same amount of playing time. And they've both had slumps. So Walker for most of April and Austin uh, right after the suspension ended. But Austin's hitting 261, Walker 211. Austin has 23 RBIs, Walker has 11. Austin's on base is 324, Walker's is 298. Um, but the power numbers are the biggest difference. Austin's OPS, which includes slugging, is 910. That's phenomenal. And Walker's is 555. That is not. And Austin has eight home runs. Walker has one. Austin's eight home runs, by the way, that would lead six ball clubs. And his 23 RBIs are the most in the majors for any player with fewer than 100 at-bats. You know, and, and if Bird gets hurt again, or Austin gets hurt, uh, the Yankees have added Adam Lind in AAA. He can play first and split time with either of them. So to me, it's a no-brainer. Tyler Austin stays, Neil Walker goes. Uh, trade Walker for a prospect or two. You get money to spend, and you get a hell of a platoon at first base. And yeah, I know Walker has more versatility. He can play third base as well as first, but you know, isn't that why we have Torres? Keep Austin. You get more offense, and you know, as Joe Kelly found out, uh, he's got a mean streak, which I like. All right, from this week's mailbag, our question of the week here on Bronx Bombers comes from Louie in Tampa. And by the way, the email is joe at bronxbomberspodcast.com, or you can find us on Twitter at Bombers Podcast is the handle, or give us a call at 646 854 4959. If you have any questions you want to have us answer on any future episodes, we are more than happy to do so. And Louie writes, We have an ongoing debate in our family, and I would appreciate your two cents. Happy to give it, Louie. Uh, my son says Thurman Munson was the best Yankee catcher ever. My grandson says it's Gary Sanchez, and I say Yogi Berra. Who is your pick? That's a great question. And look, I mean, everybody thinks the catcher they grew up watching is the best, right? And the Yankees have had so many great catchers. But, you know, as far as your grandson, I mean, Gary Sanchez, for all his potential, can't really be an option for best ever because his career is just beginning. So, and the Yankees have had some, a number of great catchers, I mean, all time greats, including two in the Hall of Fame, uh, Yogi Berra and Bill Dickey, who wasn't even mentioned in Louis' question, um, nor was a borderline Hall of Famer, Jorge Posada. So, this question really needs needs to have a third, fourth, and fifth option beyond Munson and Berra if we're going to be thorough. So um, the third option would be Bill Dickey. The fourth would be Jorge Posada. And I think the fifth should be Elston Howard. I mean, all big contributors to their respective teams. And all three played in great eras in Yankee history. Uh, Bill Dickey in the 30s, he was kind of, uh, he straddled the Gehrig and DiMaggio eras and then later became a player manager in 1946 and then became a coach. He actually helped Yogi Berra tremendously on defense. Elston Howard was on those powerful Mantle Maris teams in the early 60s. And Posada, of course, in the late 90s. So let's go through the numbers. Numbers. Home runs, first of all. Um, now, this is a cumulative stat, so it's not as important as some later stats will cover. But home runs um, are topped by Yogi Berra, who played 19 years. Um, Yogi has the top spot there with 358 home runs, followed by Posada's 275. Um, Posada played 17 years. Dickey also played 17 years and had 202. Howard hit 167. He played 14 years. 
And in Thurman Munson's 11 years, he hit 113 home runs. Sanchez, by the way, if he's blessed to have a long, healthy career, is poised to obliterate all those home run numbers. Gary Sanchez, in what's essentially been a season and a half of Major League play, has hit 65 home runs, so over half as many already as Thurman Munson in 11 years. Um, Now, Major League careers are getting shorter now, so it's unlikely that Sanchez will have a 19-year career like Yogi Berra. And Berra actually played in left uh, in later years, by the way. But let's say Sanchez has a 12-year career. That's conservative. Um, He's on pace, if he plays for 12 years, to hit a career total 520 home runs. And again, Berra, who played for 19, hit 358. So this is a special level of power we're looking at with Gary Sanchez. If he continues to rake like this and plays another 10 or 11 years, he could place in the top 25 career home run leaders of all time, more than Lou Gehrig, more than Dave Winfield. Now, as far as on-base percentage of our five former catchers, Dickey tops the list with an incredible 382 career on-base. Posada next at 374, followed by Barrett at 348. Uh, Munson just a shade behind Barrett at 346, and Howard at 322. Sanchez, by the way, at this point in his career, has the same career on base as Yogi Berra, 348. So better than Munson and Elston Howard. But on base is only half the story when it comes to offense. Power is the other half, right? And so with OPS, which, which includes on base percentage and power, we have the following ranking for our five former catchers. And people often ask me, what's a good OPS? And it's a good question. I would say, you know, very roughly speaking, 700 is very good, 800 is excellent, 900 is elite, and 1,000 is like the stratosphere. I mean, there's only seven players in Major League history that have a career OPS over 1,000, and none of them are catchers. Uh, those players from one through seven are Babe Ruth, Ted Williams, Lou Gehrig, Barry Bonds, Jimmy Fox, Hank Greenberg, and Rogers Hornsby. But with our former Yankee catchers, Dickey again tops the list at 868, Posada at 848, Berra at 830, so all three excellent, Munson at 756, and Howard at 749, so very good. Now Sanchez, and this shocked me, I mean, it shouldn't shock me, I know he's been amazing with the bat, but still, Gary Sanchez in his young career is at the very top of this list with a career OPS of 912. That's 44 points better than Dickey. Uh, Giancarlo Stanton, by the way, was a much larger body of work than Sanchez, has the same career OPS of 912, which is the 54th best career OPS ever. So when it comes to Sanchez and Stanton, we're talking like elite level, all-time great talent. So in regards to Louis's question, it seems pretty clear that Bill Dickey is the best offensive catcher in franchise history, with Posada and Barra right behind him, and Sanchez, of course, has the potential to overtake all of them. But what about defense, which is obviously a huge part of of a catcher's skill set. So there are multiple ratings for defense. There's defensive runs saved, and then Fangraphs came up with a defensive stat called total zone. That's actually more thorough. So let's look at the total zone ratings for all five of our former catchers. So just to get our bearings again, Fangraphs tells us that a total zone rating of 15 or greater is gold glove caliber. And by the way, when I make these comparisons between these, these five catchers, I didn't include things like gold glove awards because first of all, it's subjective. And second of all, the Gold Glove Award only dates back to 1957. So Dickey's career was over and Barra's was mostly over. But anyway, 15 uh, total zone rating is Gold Glove caliber. 10 is great. 5 is above average. 0 is average. Negative 5 is below average. Negative 10 is poor. Negative 15 is awful. So four of our five former catchers had gold glove caliber ratings. One did not. So in order, Elston Howard had the highest rating at 39. Munson just a few points back at 34. Barra just behind at 33. And Bill Dickey was a ways back, but still exceptional at 20. Now, Posada, whose defensive liabilities I discussed uh, uh, back in episode two, if you want to take a listen, uh, that, that was in the context of a conversation about the past ball issues that Sanchez has been having. But Posada got a negative seven rating, so below average, just three points shy of poor. And not a surprise, Gary Sanchez, after roughly a year and a half in the majors, has the exact same rating of negative seven. So look, these are all great catchers. Again, two Hall of Famers in Dickey and Berra, borderline case in Posada. The defense is going to keep him out, and rightfully so, in my opinion. 
And Elston Howard, I wouldn't call Elston Howard a borderline Hall of Famer. His offense doesn't really compare with these other four, but a great player, MVP in 1963. And Munson was the MVP in 76. And I think the only thing keeping Munson out of the Hall of Fame, honestly, is the brevity of his career. Um, But to me, you know, Bill Dickey with his gold glove caliber defense and his on-base plus slugging at the top makes him the best Yankee catcher of all time at this moment. You know, you could say, well, Barra's OPS was only 38 points lower and his total zone defensive rating was significantly better, 33 to 20. So look, it depends on how much you value fielding versus hitting. And there's no clear answer there. And in fact, in the stat, you know, wins above replacement, Barra comes in a tick higher than Dickey. Uh, Barra's average season war was 3.35, Dickey's was 3.3. That's probably due to Barra's superior defense. So I'd say, Louie, you can't really go wrong with either Dickey or Barra. They're both all world. There's a reason they're both in the Hall of Fame. And as for your son, I mean, look, Munson was was great. I mean, he was a great captain. He was great postseason player, one of my childhood heroes. And when he died, it just tore me up. He was It was shocking and sad and uh, and bewildering. But the numbers tell us that Yogi Bear was just a tick better as a player and, of course, had a much longer career to uh, excel in. And with regards to your grandson picking Gary Sanchez, it's not as crazy as it sounds. I mean, as I said, if Gary Sanchez stays healthy, he's going to obliterate all these guys from an offensive standpoint standpoint. But of course, you know, his defense has got to improve if he really wants to be considered the greatest catcher in Yankee franchise history. And that defense, uh, you know, that remains an open question as to whether he can pull that off. But thanks, Louie. That's a phenomenal question. And I also appreciate uh, your passing on the Yankee tradition to your son and your son passing it on to your grandson. That's what I call doing it right. So well done. And that'll do it for this week's episode of Bronx Bombers. Again, don't forget, you can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or Stitcher. Follow us on Twitter at Bombers Podcast is the handle. Like us on Facebook as well. But most of all, have faith in the Yankees. We'll see you in two weeks.